On my right is my, um, it's a past colleague of mine from Cusco International, um, it's Linda Kola. Uh, she is a community recreation supervisor at the city of Toronto Parks. And throughout her career, her focus on studies has been dedicated to community youth engagement and participation. Next to Linda is Tahir, Tahir Cecilia. She's the deputy um, we heard from her this morning. So I need to introduce her again. It's long, but we'll go again. She's the deputy focal point for the UN major groups for children and youth and executive board member of the Pacific Youth Council. And next to Tahir, we have Hanifa Patterson. Yes, Hanifa is a social media strategist and almost 10 years experience as an educator at various levels. She has done studies examining the relationships between Facebook and digital identity and Facebook and culture. Well, welcome. So let's give them a round of applause and welcome her to <laughs> Unfortunately, Mr. Uh, Sharaf is not here, so we have these three well-distinguished panelists. Okay, let's get on and we'll have Linda, please. Okay, I'm not going to sit, I'm going to stand, if that's okay. All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you very much for being here. Um, I have uh, a little bit to present here. We only have 15 minutes, so I might be talking fast. <laughs> and uh, hopefully the point gets across. So my presentation is called Debunking the Myths. Strategies for Outreach, Engagement, and Participation for Grenadian Youth. Um, uh, we're just going to look at what is the myth, why the myth, what that, what's that terminology and words and the significance of that. A review of the simple questions and facts. Uh, we'll look at the case study of, of the Grenada Project, which is the Rose Hill Youth Video Project. And just then we'll go into a little bit about the framework, okay? What the youth reality is. Uh, uh, a bit about some practical tools to support healthy youth development within the asset-based model. And just the conclusion, okay? The conclusion really speaks to what we as practitioners can do and what our role is in debunking that myth. So what is the myth? The myth is the traditional focus on barriers and challenges. The myth is the responsibility for action lies lying solely with the individual and that youth are apathetic and don't volunteer or, or participate. When I was in Grenada, and actually if I could explain, I was a colleague of, of Renee's. I did a volunteer stint with CUSO International, which is a Canadian NGO, and I spent uh, about a year in Grenada working as the advisor for youth participation and governance with the Ministry of Youth. Um, when I went there and started to work with the youth workers who were there, um, they kept telling me, no, Linda, Miss Linda, we can't do it. No, nope, we can't do it. You don't understand, we don't have resources, we can't do it. So those youth workers in themselves, who were young people, felt disempowered. And to me, that's a myth that we can't do it, because we can do it, even sometimes without resources, because there's certain things that, that we can rely on with the asset-based model. So myths are built from perceptions and beliefs, and re when repeated over time, those myths become reality, right? They, they become our lived reality. So debunking the myth is shifting the language from the negative to the positive, turning everything upside down, right? Words and terminology have power and strength, and if we change those words into positive, then we change our mindsets. Debunking the myth is challenging the perception that young people are simply not interested. Debunking the myth is probing and exploring where responsibility for participation and action lies. And that means finding that balance, however fine it is, between the individual or the youth and the structure. So we need to ask ourselves a few questions, okay? Are we willing to reshape our perspectives and turn those negatives upside down? That's a significant question and it's not rhetorical. Are we actually willing to do that and consciously think about doing it? Are we willing to educate ourselves and embrace strategies that allow all youth to participate and learn skills? Do we believe that youth can contribute to local, national, regional, and global progressions? So we hear words and phrases all the time. 
And I put all in capitals for a reason. Because the other thing that I saw in the Caribbean, and we've talked about this a little bit at this conference, it's come up a few times, and I call them the usual suspects. The 8 to 12 young people who are counted on to be consulted with, who are chosen to do the trips abroad or wherever throughout the Caribbean, who go to conferences, who go to meetings, and don't necessarily bring that stuff back. What about all the other youth? And those marginalized, disenfranchised youth are the ones that we want to just throw away. Throw away youth. So if we answered yes, yes, and yes, then we're well on our way. So let's look at the facts. All youth have capacity. When we assume youth do not want to participate, we are feeding a myth and a negative stereotype. More dangerously, we are excluding our young people from full engagement and participation in our society. And we all know what that does. We've seen it, the symptoms are around us, and it's not just here in the Caribbean, it's across the world. I come from Toronto, similar things happen, and I mean, I'm sorry, forgive me, I'm not Caribbean, I'm Canadian, but I will say that youth are youth are youth. And especially within the city of Toronto, where we have probably the most diverse cultural city in the world, we have people from every part of the world, we deal with all those situations. And then on top of that, we deal with the diversity and maybe the cultural disharmony that we have to do, that, that youth experience, and they experience it for real. So some youth feel powerless, hopeless, or voiceless. And it's our job as youth leader, supervisor, or facility in charge. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong slide. That was for Toronto. <laughs> Those are the jobs there. <laughs> but it's our job as youth workers to start or continue a course of action that recognizes and embraces those strengths and abilities. All youth have the willingness and drive to participate given the right set of circumstances. So again, just going back to the kind of theoretical framework, um, there's the individual, and we hope that the individual can have agency to change their situation or to take action on their own. But we also have the structure, and we can't forget about that piece. The societal factors and circumstances which influence or limit the choices and opportunities available. And that's where we come in as part of the structure. And many of us work within oppressive structures as well. So we have to be aware of that. So the case study in Grenada was a video project. And I'll just say a little bit about how it started. So I, I started to go out in the field with the youth workers. And I ended up in St. Patrick, which is a parish on the north end of the island, in the village of Rose Hill, which is very stigmatized. Stigmatized for a number of reasons, and there are a lot of issues there that especially the young people encounter. It's rural, it's marginalized, it's stigmatized. There's high unemployment, prevalent dropout of school, lack of education, illiteracy, social, economic, and political exclusion. So, we go out on the block, I go with the youth worker, Cherry Ann, and you'll see her in a second. She can explain it much better than me. <clears throat> and we start walking along and talking to different groups of youth. And we found this group of guys behind the rum shop who were smoking weed and gambling and drinking rum in the middle of the afternoon. And we started talking to them. And of course, you know, they probably thought, well, what the heck is this old white woman doing here? This is ridiculous. So. <laughs> We said to them, or Cherry Ann said to them, what is it that you guys want to do, right? And the one guy jumped up and said, ah, we want to make a video. And I said, okay. I pulled out my phone and I said, let's make a video. And he said, no, 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 no. We want a real video with a real video camera and we want the real thing. So I looked at Cherry Ann and I said, let's do it. And we're like, okay. So that's how the whole thing started. If I can just um, show you Cherry Ann's take on it. Thanks to Nixon Berry for producing this. About a month ago, we, we were doing our visit in Brazil, which is one of the communities that I work with. And um, we came across a group of young people, young men, who was actually doing their daily activities, which is gambling, behind the room shop. And there we strike up a conversation with them, asking what are the issues that are facing them, and most importantly, what are some of the solutions to the said issues that they would raise.
because we don't want them to just think of an issue and not have a solution to the problem. So while during that conversation, conversation back and forth, uh, you know, they were saying jobs is an issue, um, drop, high school dropout, teenage pregnancy, and so forth. During the conversation, one of the young men said, let's make a video. And we thought the idea was a brilliant one. And um, he probably thought we would not have done any follow-up about it. But we did. We went back to the community and we started making preparation and they are really excited knowing that we do take them seriously um so in the pro right now we are in the process of um we did all the preliminary work instead of drawing up our proposal um it's a slow process because you know we didn't realize that all these little bits and pieces that you had to put together so right now that's what we were doing we we're having a plan a steering committee a planning committee actually and um we are visiting a community this right now to put all that in planning committee is actually made up of the young men within, within the community we're, and then persons from all different organizations so i am actually just facilitating that 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 project they are the ones who's going to come up with the ideas as to what it is that they want on the on the on the video and um who we can we can identify in that video in order to tell their life stories it's a community that is stigmatized with a lot of negativity so we want to bring out the positive of all of these young people and showcase their, their talent there is a young man who actually who do, does farming, so we're going to feature him on the farm. And he he is one of the young men who have been entangled with the law. So he story. There's another young man who have a small business. He also had a very challenging past. So all these stories that we're going to bring up. So they are the young persons who's going to spearhead. We are just facilitating that. And in during that project, we we hoping not hoping actually what we want to do is skill transfers so we're going to help them make decisions positive decisions also by then we should they should be able to come up with a skill as to being media um how to do video the whole pr so we are this is what we are facilitating Thank you. so um i'm going to ask you the youth reality she basically said it, right? And just looking at the research, that's a bit of it there. Throughout all the research that's been done in the Caribbean about Caribbean youth, there's an overwhelming sense of hopelessness among youth, especially marginalized and dis disenfranchised. But the sense of hopelessness is the greatest barrier, but it can also be looked at as the space that offers the greatest potential for resolution. So again, it's about what our mindset is, right? We can give up on that hopelessness or we can use it as, a, as an avenue to start engaging and developing meaningful relationships. So youth are not the embodiment of problems that are endemic to society, yet this is the mythical diatribe that situates structural problems and challenges with the young people in our societies. Rather, youth are unduly impacted by the problems and challenges inherent in the society, created and perpetuated by the societal structure. So. We, we used, um, as part of our framework in asset-based youth development, the ladder of participation to help us define and see a picture of the fact that we have a ladder and all youth have capacity, but they may come in the, into us or engage with us with that different level of capacity. So they enter the ladder at a different rung. So if we're working with five youth or 10 youth, we have five, or 10 different life patterns and, and activities that we need to support. So as Cherry Ann said, we have to facilitate that and be adaptable to whatever the youth bring to us. Because all youth are not gonna jump on at the top rung with loads of capacity, you know, high levels of literacy, high levels of education, etc. We have to be willing to take that person that comes on the lower end of the rung and help him move him or her move through the ladder. So I've already said that. 
the Rose Hill Video Project, uh, what did we get out of it? It actually is not finished, and I left Grenada in April. And that may be due to a bit of lack of structural support, but I'm not going to go there. Um, Cherry Ann's on her own out in that community. We ended up getting a little bit of funding from CUSO and from St. George's University, which is the American University in Grenada. We hired a videographer who came from not that community, but a community similar to Rose Hill. By the time I left, I went to the last meeting. As Cherry Ann said, we committed to going there every single week. And those guys never thought we would come back because they've heard that so many times before. Yes, we're going to do this, we're going to help you, and then nobody shows up, right? We came back there every single week, and believe me, it was one step forward and two steps back. Because the guy who said he wanted to make the video, you know, we went the one week and he had smoked way too much weed, so we couldn't talk. Uh, the next time we went, somebody else who was supposed to be involved had robbed somebody and he was running away because he was going to get beat up. So it was a bit of a struggle, but we kept going. And by the time I left in April, the meeting was incredible. And I don't know how you measure that, but we had the meetings out on the street because that's the only place they wanted to meet. Um, one of the supervisors said, no, 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 Cherry Ann, you have to have the meeting in the community center, which was way down the block and around the corner. But she said, no, this is where they want to meet. So the last meeting I went to was what they call the junction, where the two roads come together. And actually, when I started talking to those guys, they call it the Gaza, because they want to be like Jamaica. <laughs> so, but what happened at that meeting was amazing interaction no longer did they look at me like, you know, what's this woman doing here, right? As an outsider, we were having conversations, they were talking to each other because we were at the junction. All kinds of other people who were walking by came over and said, what's going on? So they got engaged. You know, they had their cooking going on in the corner and, you know, with the pot on the fire. And it, the joy in all of those guys, like, and the exuberance and the excitement, and what came out of it was they, at that meeting, they said, we want you to bring the senator next time because we have a few things to say to the senator. Advocacy, right? At its lowest level, but it's still advocacy. So there are a few tools, and I'm not going to go through this because I don't have time. <clears throat> but I think we do need practical tools. We can talk about theory. We can talk about the sense of hopelessness. We can talk about turning words upside down. But we actually need the tools to go out there to help us, you know, deliver that asset-based model. <clears throat> so, of course, in our minds, we have to have the concept and understanding of what a transformative and asset-based youth development policy is. And I got that from the Grenada National Youth Policy that was drafted while I was there. Uh, a great document. We have to understand the difference between equity and equality. There's a difference. We can use the ladder of participation as a way of looking at youth and how they engage. In Toronto, we've developed the Youth Leadership Framework, which is five simple principles of healthy youth development, which can basically guide us in whatever we do with youth, not just leadership programs. Um, using project planning to engage all youth in a process. The project of the video wasn't us coming in saying, okay, we're gonna do a curriculum-based youth leadership program with you or skills development. No, it was what do they wanna do and using that project to take them through a process. By youth and for youth is very important, okay? And again, it's not just words. Empowering youth, that's a brand that we use, that my youth staff in Toronto have developed for um, saying that we have to empower youth workers in order to then go empower youth. Um, so just a, a di quick diagram to show the difference between equality and equity, okay? We have to accommodate. In equity, we accommodate to allow everybody to have the same view. Um, the Youth Leadership Framework. I have some handouts here with uh, one-pagers if you're interested in that. Um, just equity, diversity, and inclusion. We all have those usual suspects, right? The small core group of youth volunteers who readily participate and take on responsibility. But accommodating diversity and being inclusive means broadening our notions of positive youth identity. Is it possible for us to expand our definition, our scope of inclusion, and therefore our supports? And I can't emphasize this enough. It's 
Even though we don't yet have the video as a project, the process is important. Now, hopefully we get there, right? But often the process is more important than the end product because it's through the process and through that engagement and through that dialogue where you're able to live in a bit of chaos and allow the youth to come up with whatever directions they want to go in. So you may start out at the beginning and say, in the end, here's where we want to be. But through this and that and the one step forward and the two steps back, we end up over there. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the importance of process is that through the process, skills get transferred. Um, perhaps the youth are carrying out functions of volunteering without even realizing it. So that whole notion and the myth of those youth don't want to volunteer, well, you know, however many of them came out to the junction that day, and essentially they were there willing to volunteer and eager. So the responsibility lies with the practice as well as the youth themselves. And the practice, I mean us. In the case of Rose Hill, the investment was focused on the youth worker, really, to build her capacity to build the capacity of the youth. She had the raw goods to begin with, believe me. She was amazing, and those kinds of communities were her comfort zone. But she looked to have support, and the words, and for lack of a better term, the theoretical framework to help her go forward. Those were, those were her ammunition. And she needed that mentorship. She needed that support. And we all do. An establishment of meaning rela meaningful relationships is the springboard. So through that first interaction that we had, and going there every week, and you get used to each other, and you start to develop this meaningful relationship, and you start to talk to one another, and you talk about you know, what your personal feelings are, or you laugh about whatever, and you have a sense of humor, those meaningful relationships are really the foundation of any kind of asset-based youth development. Okay, and just the last quote. Uh, Nobody can teach me who I am. You can describe parts of me, but who I am and what I need is something I have to find out by myself. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much, Linda. And let's move along. So it's on you, Yes, sure. Is this one? Okay. Thank you. Good morning again, everyone. Good morning. Um, my presentation is on um, my research that I conducted for um, my final paper. Um, and I conduct, my topic was exploring the intrinsic benefits of young people's participation in the arts. Um, a, a prominent perception in youth development today is that when, I mean like what we look forward for young people, what we expect from young people is that they go through education successfully and transit, transition successfully into getting a job, right? So we're always expecting that from young people, from young till they finish high school, university, and into the labor market. So they are, they become inclined to numerous risks and numerous um, vulnerabilities, and then they automatically become targeted as beneficiaries under numerous um, youth development programs and projects and so forth. So my research was specifically conducted here in Jamaica, in downtown Kingston, um, in a place called Parade Gardens. Um, and in Parade Gardens in downtown, on a whole, historically is um, a garrison. Um, so the young people there are confronted and they're prone to a lot of issues, high, employ high unemployment, substance abuse, crime and violence, and so, and so forth. A lot of domestic dispute, disputes, disputes, um, sexual exploitation as well. So all of these various and numerous vulnerabilities and um, issues actually lead it leads a young person to become socially excluded. Um, social exclusion was one of the major um, issues that I highlighted in, in in my research because it is a critical concern to young people. And although the aforementioned issues do contribute or, um, to social exclusion. Social exclusion itself entails far more than just the tangible um, problems that we could see 
um, confronting young people. Um, so as a result, the youth development programs that we have in place are often shaped to improve and increase socioeconomic outcomes and benefits, so such as educational attainment and better health, um, positive, being a positive and law-abiding um, citizen, and also um, getting a job, getting employed. So these socioeconomic um, outcomes can be, or in other means, um, considered as an extrinsic benefits, which is the term that I use in um, my research. So most dialogues, most discussions, and even research on youth development have mainly revolved around these socioeconomic issues and extrinsic benefits, thus overshadowing more important um, <coughs> developmental areas in which young people are constantly being socially excluded from in youth development, such as youth participation and meaningful engagement, and a lack of focus on emotional and psychological benefits, which are um, highlighted in my study on intrinsic um, benefits. So the main objectives of my research was one, to explore the perspectives of the young people in my research on youth participation. Um, secondly, is to identify the intrinsic benefits um, for young people gained from participating in an arts-based intervention. And specifically for um, this research, um, the arts-based interventions intervention under study is conducted by an informal youth-led community-based group called Pink Jamaica. Um, you can start the slideshow, please. Um, it's, I've, the moment I heard about Pink Jamaica, um, it quickly grabbed my, my interest and my attention because just a foreign, one young lady from Germany just comes to Jamaica, meets up with her close, uh, with um, her artist friends, and said, hey, let's do an arts intervention. Let's go do an arts project in an inner city somewhere here in Jamaica. So with a group of eight young people who came together and planned and laid out this whole plan, they went down to parade gardens um, through, of course, a contact. Um, selected a site, so the young people within the communities um, chose the an old warehouse that's just been um, um, no longer in use. So they gave that site to Paint Jamaica and said, let's use this site and do what you want. For nine weeks, members of Paint Jamaica were in the community, in and out of the community, walking the streets, asking people, not just young people, but asking members of the community in terms of what kind of painting or what messages do you want us to design or sketch um, art around to paint on your walls. At first they said, you know, people were a bit skeptical, but as they saw the um, young people of Paint Jamaica coming in throughout the nine weeks and saw that, okay, these guys are really serious they started to give in and suggest the ideas. The, the, um, the main artists in Paint Jamaica, they would go home, come up with a sketch, next day go around the streets again and say, do you like this? Is it related, um, does it um, bring out the message that you want us to, I mean, that you wanted? So basically the sketches that they painted on the walls is actually a consensual, um, um, ideas and messages from the members themselves, including young people. So, um, in terms of, I guess what my research was really looking at was also from the informal um, side of um, youth, of youth development, um, yes, of youth development, because I feel that a lot of um, our programs focus so much on trying to get socioeconomic benefits for young people and then we lack so much on developing very important moral and um, psychological what uh, intrinsic yes um, well-being of young people so for instance if you if a young person gets a job right just any job 
is that young person um, does that young person value his or her job right because if that person's intrinsic um, doesn't find any intrinsic value in what they do then they will easily fail in what they do because that's they don't see any value in it therefore they don't see values in themselves in doing whatever they're doing so what paint what I really looked at was how did this group of young people just come together an informal group and go down into a community and start this project on their own um, getting funds and paint from donations through donations and fundraising on their own just go in there consult the community and they started um, engaging young people so most of the um, it was mostly uh, sorry it was mostly 10 to 14 so it was mostly adolescents who were participating in in the in the um, arts project and some of the community members as of now a, gr a community based group that already existed in Prairie Gardens called Life Yard if you go down there today they don't miss a single foreigner or a number of visitors now coming into Parade Gardens to visit. Artists and uh, music artists are coming into Parade Gardens now just to either add on to what's already there or contribute to Life Yard. So Paint Jamaica at the moment is now like on, on hold with the project, but Life Yard, they've really, Paint Jamaica has really impacted on this community-based group that they've rise to the occasion. <coughs> they've come up with their own projects, right? They've organized um, art projects, um, drum, drum classes, and other um, little initiatives for, for the young people, engaging young people, especially adolescents within, within their community. So really, I was interested in finding out how these young people felt when they were engaging in this arts-based um, intervention. What I really got out of it was, it was the responses from the young people really reflected. It was mainly to do with though with the paint Jamaica mem with members of the paint Jamaica, not only because they were young, but the um, the the adolescents shared that they've never met or they've never been in a diverse group of um, young people, not just. Um, ethnic backgrounds but the different um, uh, artistic talents that they had because they started to have yoga, they started to have um, dance classes, they started to have all sorts of um, uh, talented people coming into to the community and teaching them different things. So, okay, five minutes. So um, what I got from it important um, was that they re it was really it was really the process of how Paint Jamaica did it that really played the most impact on, on, on the young people because they mentioned and they shared, even the older youth, they shared that they've, been, they've had some mainstream um, youth development programs happening like entrepreneurship um, and capacity building life skills um, programs happening in their community, but they really didn't feel like something, <laughs> they didn't really feel like they gained anything out of it. And they used this, um, they used Paint Jamaica as an example of making them really feel like they belonged, um, finally, um, to something. Because even though the group who organized this is from outside of the community, but they, the <coughs> process of how they did things really gave a sense of belonging to the young people who were there and most importantly to the wider community. So at the end of it, I've actually found that um, even through some of the informal um, youth work that we do, it does give um, a lot of um, intrinsic benefits, benefits for young people, but it really does depend on the process of how we carry out whatever program or whatever project that we do. So that's what I learned from them. It's how they did it 
not exactly what they did. It's just how Jamaica engaged, Pink Jamaica engaged them in the process that really mattered and really impacted on um, the young people in Parade Gardens. So I guess I'll stop there. Good morning, everyone. So, um, uh, what I'll be speaking on, the, the absence of my, well, let's, let's start here. On Tuesday this week, um, I parked my car in Brooklyn supermarkets and I returned to realize that my laptop was gone and my handbag was gone. And I was presenting this week. As you heard, I work in social media and Facebook and all my research, all my work was on this laptop, everything. Uh, but on Wednesday at around two o'clock on Facebook, I found the laptop. From Facebook, I was also able to see the name of the individual, what he did, which was linked to his Instagram. So I found out his WhatsApp, his email, his BlackBerry pin. <laughs> and so this is where I'm going to start my introduction on <coughs> the power of social media and Facebook. <laughs> I will say, however, that you know I didn't get it back. I'm really upset about that. I spent the entire day at the police station yesterday. So this is why I don't have a great presentation. So please bear, bear with me. Um, I've been living, I stand for a little bit and I'll sit because you know my work is here from the papers. So I've been living in Paris for the last seven years. This is where I studied Facebook. And how it started was that having, I went there to teach, and I realized in all my classes, students on their iPhones. This is in France, so France, in, in France they, they te they're, they're really into Mac products, so everybody had an iPhone. And I noticed students are, you know, I'm a, I think I'm a good teacher, and they're all on their iPhones. So when I decided to do um, so a master's study, I said I want to research Apple. This, this, I believe this technology is going to change the world. This was in 2008. My director said, no. No, I don't want to do this. It's not interesting to me. This is France, huh? We don't care. So then I had to come up with something else. And so that started the whole idea of me explaining every time they asked in the class, what are you studying? Saying Facebook. Now, this was only four years after Facebook had started, when they had probably 18 million French users and around 100 and maybe 120 users worldwide. We've come a long way since then. Last October, Facebook hit 1 billion. And now, we are just in September, the last statistic I saw, we are now at 1.49 billion. In April of last year, we, um, I'm saying we as if I worked at Facebook. <laughs> in April of last year, Facebook had their biggest, um, well, you, can't, you measure users in terms of active users, people who log in monthly, people who, uh, and you have the users who are just on in general. So 1.49 in general, but you can measure how many log in act actively per day. And in April this year, they had their best ever, where one million people were logged into Facebook this year. So. One out of seven people in this world were locked into Facebook this year, on one day. This is amazing. Um, and so, uh, I, I really thought that this would be an interesting thing to study, to look at Facebook and how it would affect, how it's gonna, I, I thought it was gonna affect how people interact. Bear in mind, as I said, this is 2008, we just had Facebook. It's no longer just for Harvard students. Um, your mother wasn't really on it yet, you know, um, but it was still developing a bit more. And so there was this interest that no Facebook had brought, essentially, I considered it, brought my past into my present. Because that girl from, from prep school, who I thought I'd never see again, is gonna send me a message saying, hi, can you add me? Right, so it was, it, it's reduced space, it reduced time, because also, as someone living in, the, in France now, before I lived in Canada for a, a term, while on exchange at UWE, and I remember every Thursday, having to sit at that little payphone and call my dad in Jamaica and talk to him for 30 minutes until my five Canadian finished, right? No, I could send my dad a message whenever. He, and you know, I'm refusing his Facebook request. 
you know. So things had changed significantly, and so I used two researchers, um, Marshall McLuhan. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. Understanding the understanding. I can't remember the medium. I said the medium. The medium is the, the message. Medium. And looking at the fact that in this case, yes, the medium, this medium was new. It was based on Web 2.0, which had certain factors that were different. Yes, we had High Five. Yes, we had email, but it was not the same. We had MySpace, but it still wasn't the same. Because, I, um, for example, the new speed, the new speed was introduced, and I don't want to misquote the date, but when it was, it was introduced, this was different. You, at that time, you could see live. If your friend posted, I'm having chocolate milk, it would come up immediately in your newsfeed. <laughs> this did not exist before, right? Um, they had changed. You could post photos in, a, in an album. It was like high five, you had like 12 photos. Here you could post several photos um, in several albums. You could also post a status update. So I could tell you that I'm having chocolate milk right now, uh, as if you were interested, you know? <laughs> and so this, this, this thing, I thought, this is going to be interesting. There was then the as also the aspect that I believe that people were managing identities. Because yes, I'm in France, I'm going to post a picture of me running through the, the snow, when really I, you know, five minutes ago I was like upset, you know, that you know, somebody pushed me or something. I was managing what I put. And so would this affect normal relations? I remember I had a case, this, this really concerned me, of a friend, a, a classmate who added me on Facebook. And she saw me one day coming from class, she said, oh, that blonde guy on your page, he's very cute, who is he, is your boyfriend? And I thought, oh my, you don't really talk to me in class, but you're going to ask me, who is the guy on my Facebook page? You never commented on my Facebook page. You've never, you know, but you are watching me. <laughs> so it affects how we communicate. And even since being back, right, there are people who I will walk past in the streets. They will walk past me, but they're on my Facebook. Or who will say to me, I see you're having fun being back, man. And I'm thinking, really, you are? Because you never talk to me on Facebook. So this, I knew, would, I wanted to know, would this have an effect on how we communicated in the offline world, because it, it was affecting to some extent our online world. So this, these were the things I looked at using, using uh, Marshall McLuhan, using another person called Guy Debord. Guy Debord. Um, he spoke, you know, anybody knows of Guy Debord? Well, he spoke, he was looking at the fact that we, <laughs> it's very funny, that we basically were in this, it's all in French, so I'm trying to translate in my head at the same time that we are participating in this observation of each other and the only reason we participate is because I want to get to observe <coughs> you. So to, to get to do this, I have to be in this to, to get to see and my curiosity takes the best of me. So I, I really want to know what you're up to. So I will add you, you know? So I measured, I looked at some, looked at different types of personalities. So I had the, the reflection, which the person was, what you see is what you get. Then you had the outline, which the person is what you see is not really what you get, but it's, it's kind of who they are. Um, then I had the shadow, the shadow, and for the shadow is that this is the kind of person, I'm sure we all know them, who they probably have a cat for their Facebook picture. <laughs> they're, you know, they're watching, they, they're, they have a Facebook presence, but they're not really, they're, they're really there to watch, you know, they're not really, you don't really know anything about them. And then you have the chameleon, the person who probably has, at that time, people, you had Facebook pages that were Jesus Christ. There were several Jesus Christ Facebook pages. And we know Jesus Christ, you know, even if he, he lives, it's not, he, he's not on Facebook, okay? <laughs> so, to have 16 of them is not possible. <laughs> so, this was a, a type of um, person that we, we noticed. So, all these things I felt were relevant. Now, let's flash forward to today. I'm going to just give you a few... I only have 15 minutes, so I can't go into all the details. But, um, and it's all lost, but anyway. Um, just to give you a bit of the detail, I just want to show you the state of Facebook now, compared to then. Then you had a 60 character limit on what you could write. Then you had um, only 60 photos until people like, no, we want more, they gave them more. Um, one statistic suggests that 350 million photos are uploaded per day, right? 
YouTube was the great, was, I think Facebook has now surpassed YouTube in terms of video. So Facebook is dominant. Social media is here to stay and it's, gonna, it's going to change the world. Um, it has changed the world. So just a few statistics to show you the change now um, and then to get to the point of why I think this is important to the Caribbean and why we focus, how we can focus this in the Caribbean. Um, is that every second, pardon, every second there are 20,000 people on Facebook. This, mean in eight, this means that in just 18 minutes there are 11 million users on Facebook. 79% um, uh, of users are using it from their mobile. Um, every minute there are 150, every minute there are 150,000 messages sent. Every 15 minutes, there are over 49 million posts. Or so, to, to be precise, 49,433,000 or 3 million posts per minute. Okay? There are 100,000 friend requests every minute. Facebook generates, brace yourself, 1.4 million in revenue every hour. Facebook generated 12.47 billion in sales in 2014. And that's a rise of 58% in one year, okay? And this is driven a lot by mobile, okay? 31% um, of US senior citizens are on mobile. And contrary to popular belief, the largest, number, the largest demographic on Facebook now is over 45. I heard a girl, somebody said, you're on Facebook, and a girl said, oh, nobody, I, I'm not on Facebook, nobody's on, I don't use Facebook that way anymore. It's, it's Instagram or it's Twitter. So Facebook is so last year. So okay, 66 um, percent of millennials use Facebook, and this one is funny too. People spend 927 million hours a month playing Facebook games. <laughs> okay, um, and just some general statistics now, because Instagram. I'll let you know that Instagram is owned by Facebook, so it's WhatsApp. They also just recently bought something called Oculus Rift. It is virtual reality. <coughs> and I read a post by Mark, Mark, I don't know him personally, Mark Zuckerberg. And he said that this is the future because imagine being able to play your games, no more Candy Crush on your phone, but through virtual reality. Imagine also being able to consult your doctor through virtual reality where you can sit, not on Skype, but where it feels as if you can touch your doctor. This is the direction Facebook is going. Um, and so, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go fast, but I think we've got a little time. Um, so, every, just on LinkedIn, every third, every two seconds, two new members join LinkedIn. Social media has taken over porn as the number one online activity. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right? No, is it, no so communi communi and this is it, this is where I'm going. Communication, com well, let me not go there just yet. Let me follow my, <laughs> my, my little presentation. So um, what I'm saying about that is that today Facebook is uh, <laughs> amazing. In that there, are 700 million user, there are 700 million users on WhatsApp, 600 million users on Facebook Messenger, and 300, over 300 million on Instagram. And Facebook owns this. What's is the, the solid, what's the, 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 the central item? It's data. Data is important. Data is the future. Data, big data, is where money is. And listening this morning and listening here as well, content is where money is. And the Caribbean, this is the direction we need to go, in, go, to, go into. We are talented people. I'm telling you, no offense to anybody from any other country. I know wonderful people from many other countries. <laughs> One of my best friends is Dutch, but there's something in the water in Jamaica. We're special, there's something, we're very creative. And I think this is ideal for us. This is a way for us to focus on the theme, as in, let's focus on this. Yes, there are many challenges. Yes, there's a lot of crime, but we can become the place where content is created where we create excellent films, where we, films, you mentioned it, excellent art, where we create excellent movies, where we push this out 
on YouTube, they're being, they're, on YouTube right now, there are people who do not need to work. YouTube pays them per subscriber and per video. Their, pe their job is to be a YouTuber. They help Google get money, right? Um, so this can be a solution to many of the issues that we're having here. Um, I understand that Bella Blair, that girl who does the yes. videos, yes. she's the first, uh, from her Instagram, I saw her say, <laughs> she's the first um, local person to, to be paid by YouTube, right? So this is a solution because guess what? We don't need the best camera. We don't need, I, I would prefer to have my MacBook, but we don't need it. We can do it with an iPhone. We can create great content. We can create it in our backyards. We can create it with our friends on the corner. This will be, this is driven. The majority, people are always asking, and this is the, the part of me as a social media strategist now, because I saw that there would be potential for this, is that people are always asking me, how can we become, how can I go, oh Lord, one minute, how can I go viral? The thing is, you don't go viral, you create, you, you don't plan. You create content, you keep creating content until one day somebody or a group of people resonate with the content so much that it goes viral. You don't plan to go viral. That's like saying, let's plan to get a cold. You don't plan it. But if you get it, everybody in your house is gonna get it too and probably your neighbors if they send their kid over. So this is how it works, right? And so I'm just gonna quickly give the last points that I had. Um, if I can have like 30 seconds, please. Um, <laughs> The very last one, it was just that I think for me, what happened to me was that my director was not very encouraging because he could not see the vision of Facebook. He told me, oh, Facebook, c'est quoi? What is Facebook? Pas c'est rien. C'est le télé. It's TV. TV is still, the, is still. And he lived to eat his words. So I think this will be the challenge today. <coughs> I hope you guys see that video. This will be the challenge today that in moving forward, we're gonna to have to have a level of bravery, a level to be willing that vision, not everybody will have the vision, that we will have to be trailblazers. A trailblazer doesn't get everybody ahead, you know, get everybody with you, you go ahead of it. And I realized I, I didn't publish my work and now I'm seeing people who publish similar things and I go, oh dear. But in the Caribbean, we need people who, as is in her case, people who come and support to say, yes, this app that you have is a great idea. We are going to push it forward and make it awesome, right? So we, I want people, does somebody just list the points that I had? That we need to observe and listen. Observe what problems are around. What is causing the problem? So Facebook was causing me a problem in my classes. So now, observe it. Then the next step, we need to question, see how can I use this same issue? How can I then use Facebook to solve a problem? Because if they're, if they're going to use Facebook, they're going to use Facebook. So how can I use Facebook? I can probably have a Facebook group for my class. I can, you know, get it involved, um, get them involved. I'm really just reading the points. I know I only have like 30 seconds. Um, seek. So read widely. There are a lot of time, many times, many ideas I get regarding my studies, regarding Facebook or, you know, like, you know, sometimes I feel obsessed with it, but... Um, is, is from ordinary people, has nothing to do with, with social media, but this feeds, um, it, it feeds, it, 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 it just gives you an idea, it murders and has this idea of babies. You didn't plan for it, you know, you understand? So this is why we should read extensively, speak to different people, because you never know, something just catches a spark and you go, ah, this could go with that, and something interesting could be born. So I'm encouraging the youth to read, um, solve a problem, being ab the, the abstract, abstract issues are no longer, it's no longer, the people don't care. People want to know, okay, you got this great idea, how can we make money? How can it change somebody's life? So if it's even a game, who would have thought planting little, uh, doing little animals on Facebook would make <laughs> millions? With with this? Who would have thought this? No, but we can do it. Um, uh, and the last thing, harness big data. Let's find ways, there's not a lot of big data in the, Caribbean, in the Caribbean, very little information. We need to then start doing research to find out how many users are on Facebook from Jamaica? How are we using it? Why are we using it this way? Because then, this is what Facebook uses and what we can use to drive sales, to sell advertising, to create great products that can then be exported or can just develop other industries here. 
And the last thing I assure you is to, you know, as I said, step out into, step out with the challenges, you know, go ahead and push forward even if others don't support you. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you. So now we will um, take some comments and questions from you. I it's so interesting that I noticed that last night. So there was this guy celebrating that he has this latest I-6, wherever it is. And there's this other guy saying, oh yeah, I, I'm warming up my left vocals for tomorrow. <laughs> you, know, you get it? Mm -hmm. You see, I think it's a paradigm shift. We need to, you know they used to say you are the future of tomorrow. I think you should say to themselves, they are from the future. Yes. So in that way, they're offering solutions now and for the future. You know, and, and that's when we need to take the paradigm shift to encourage creativity and innovativity, that kind of thing within the region and the, the global space. Uh, I think a lot, we are consumers of what's happening in, 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 in the more bigger global yeah. picture. Um, one of the things, the other part of it, and that will come with the other presentation from Linda, Linda and Tahira, is that I've learned from my practice of youth development is young people just waiting to be engaged. You, know, you wouldn't believe all the, the myths, you talk about the bunking the myths. Yeah, they're hopeless. But if you go to them genuinely and you want to help, they will participate, you know? Uh, and I think that's one of the key for the practice of your development is that they engage in, they engage in where they are at. Mm -hmm. Whatever ladder, uh, part of the ladder of participation they are, that's what we need to do. Yeah, so that's my comment. Um, I think the point you made is, is I had a great first point, I forgot. But the second point, I think this is why Facebook and social media does well, because it is engaging the youth. So when they don't have the time, when they, when they don't have anything to do, this is it, they can go online and watch something. This is always there, this is how it is designed. And then big companies can make the money from this. Um, this is what social media is about. I'm always telling clients, it's about getting your, your followers engaged. So it's very interesting using the terminology, you know, how he, he put it kind of like clicked for me that yes, engagement is, um, is the, the key. And so, yeah, we need to do that. I can't remember the first point. It was, it was okay, but sorry. Welcome. Does anyone have? It's very comforting to hear you say stuff like you need to move content. Um, you don't have to get cameras. You don't have, you know, because one day, uh, recently we had the Jamaica Film Festival. And Jamaica, the producers, I've been hearing from them, well, um, we don't have the funding, we don't have this, or we don't have that. <coughs> Yet still, there are American film producers who make films from their phones. So it's very comforting to hear. Now, the problem that I see in Jamaica, and probably the Caribbean, is that we think too much about outsourcing. We don't really have that mindset to say, hey, I can create a Facebook, I can create a Twitter, I can create this. And also, I don't think we have the opportunity. As you said, um, we need to get to use where they're at. I consistently point to a scam that's happening in Jamaica, Nigeria, and some other countries. It takes a brilliant mind to do something like that. <laughs> and if you can get to them and say, hey, you don't have to do that in the activity, you can probably rework it to, you know, get that content out there positive. So we need to engage them as much as we should, as much as we can. So I, I remember, I, um, can I get carried for now? I remembered my point. Um, it's basically that in the US, in, in other countries, the culture, as you said, focuses, pardon, in Europe, in the US, the culture sees youth as he said, the future. 
that they are the brilliant minds of the future. So they don't have the, 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 the thought, like the lady said before, of I should be seen and not heard. Or in Jamaica, I'm, I feel like I want to be heard, but I feel guilty because somebody's going to shut me down. They feel entitled to be heard. So they are going to do it. They think I have the, and this can, can be negative. I didn't touch on that, but there's a negative aspect because this is why we have some videos on Facebook that really you should click the report button and get it reported. They're inappropriate, but they really feel entitled to be heard. So as he's saying, if we can get them to say, I can be heard and I can get guidance to be heard in the right way, then we can use the content. But the other content with you know certain, Certain videos, you know, that I've seen, we know that this cannot. This is only going to this tr give a wrong image of the Caribbean, which we don't want. So we have to really. There's a responsibility on our part to manage it, as well, especially to social social shaming. I don't know if you've noticed that as well. So these are some issues that we have to manage, while allowing them to exp to you know explore and flourish. Oh, Thank one you. More. One more quick comment. Just a quick comment. Thank you very much for bringing that issue up. That's the creativity of all you, mm -hmm. right? No matter what, what, where they are on the spectrum. And yes, we need to start recognizing that. I read an article in the, in the Toronto paper the other day about this super jail that they built, this prison. And they're having all these problems and they actually could not, uh, it said in the article they could not serve food on styrofoam, con in styrofoam containers anymore because those guys found a way to melt this stuff over and over and over and over again and make a knife, okay? And I thought, my God, that is like such creativity. We are really doing something wrong. We need to go in these prisons, and instead of throwing those people away, we need to capitalize on the creativity that they have. Yeah. Okay. Fourteen years old, and I asked about the Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Jamie Ashman. I'm from Jamaica, and I work with National Affairs Action. So this question is actually done. Our our organization is a not-for-profit, and what we do is it's an anti-corruption organization. So what we what we've been trying to do for the better half of the well, the further half of the year, is to try to engage youth on social media. When we started out, we actually had about 200 <coughs> likes, most of which were not. So we tried various things. We, we got a social media specialist, and <laughs> that didn't work out. And then we tried doing it in-house ourselves. So we tried to bring on information into bite-sized pieces. We tried to use memes, videos, trying to ask them when we go out to meet them, to to take pictures, tell them to like the post, type themselves in the picture, share it with their friends, show what you're doing. And it's only just broken a thousand plus likes. Now when we go on and we see who is sharing our content, right? Remember this is content pertaining to government and stuff like that. It is the same person and a lot of the persons are actually outside of you. How it is that we can get you to move away from sharing just their party pictures the one the the run of the mill stuff that they do every day, like what they eat for breakfast, to actually having conversations on social media about governance and how to get involved. Because you're finding that this is where they are, but how do you get them into the conversation? Because we've been trying, we try to post that various hours of the day to see which is best. All of that kind of stuff, you know? But it's just not it's just not working. Yeah, yeah, sure. Good morning, everyone. Nicole Brown, representing the Labour House of Assembly, originally from Jamaica. Um, I wanted to know, in terms of the the issue with social media, you you, you mentioned that key point a while ago that what's the girl's name? Bella, Bella Blair. Because even you were, I was in in Tobago on. Was it? Yeah, over the weekend, and friends were shared were on their phones, you know, Trini friends, you know, talking about this 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 video and her series of videos. What I wanted to know is that I've noticed that a lot um, that in the Caribbean we are very much whether it is Facebook or whether it is cars, shoes, whatever it is, we are mass consumers of whatever it is. So nowadays we have the social media. How do we change our mindset? 
as a people, not just one or two individuals, but as an entire people of the Caribbean, mind, change that mindset from being mass consumers to being mass producers, so that we are on the, the end of the profitability side of things. So not just that we are spending X amount of hours on social media, but we are gaining X amount of revenue from using social media. How do we change that mindset as a society? Okay. Okay, I'm trying to remember those two questions. Um, first thing, um, what's your name again? Jamie. Jamie. Okay, listening to you, you've done all the strategies. It's clear. I was like, okay, 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 taking them off mentally. Um, however, social media is about getting people to like, know, and trust you. So you need to ask yourself, have you done that? That's one. Do people, social media also has to go with traditional marketing. Many people don't realize that. They think social media is just on its own. No. Why? In the beginning, if you notice on Facebook, you could get everything. If somebody ate chocolate at 2, you'd see it in your newsfeed. If they ate, it at, if they ate a sweet at 2.30, you'd get it in your newsfeed. Now Facebook is only showing you the last statistic I heard. I think it was 10%. 10% I wrote something on it. Um, so if you have a, you have 1,500 posts, when they worked it out, the average number of users is 150. And there are people who have more friends than 150. So I have 1,500. And so you multiply that by every post that people make, you're gonna get a lot of information. So Facebook wants to manage the quality of information. And so they've, cut, they've changed their algorithm to manage that. So you don't see every post. So of your thousand likes, when you post something, all the thousand doesn't see, they don't see it. Just to let you know, they don't. Actually, it has declined so much from, it was 16% in 2013, went down to 14, went down to 12.5. Now in some cases, only 1% of the people on your, your the likes see. So if you have even a million likes, only 1% of them will see. So don't knock yourself, you're doing your best. However, Facebook is tired of doing all of this for free. They wanna make money. They, they are, I know, personally, I know marketers who, they don't deal with social media clients unless they're, you, as a client, you can spend half a million dollars, US in ads and so forth. They play the big games, big shots, right? So money is being made. So for, for you, I want to say that you have to, you don't, uh, boosting is, we need to speak. Boosting, take time with the boosting. Um, but ads, Facebook ads, they want you to spend your money. So they cut down what you can see, you understand? Also, you have to be spe specific with your audience and I suggest that you, do, you get the youth more involved offline in this cause. They need to see this cause as important. Um, and I believe, tapping into your question, I don't think that many youth are you know, socially conscious. You know, That we talk a big talk, but we're not really engaged in, in projects. Like, because the project, I've never heard of this project. You see, and you, you, we, we know only, a, a, I remember when I was at UE, that's about 15 years ago, it was like only 3% of the population was university educated. That was the statistic I saw. I'm sure it's higher now, but it's still not the majority. So the people who are interested, who should be interested, what do we do? We leave for better opportunities. So probably you need to find some new ways of getting youth involved so we've seen, for example, I think Digital does a good job. And the reason they do a good job, why? Because they have huge underground marketing. They have Digital Rising Stars. They have their, their, they're running the marathons. They do a lot that pushes um, their social media, that drives their social media. So I would suggest that. To answer your question, your question again was, how do we get people more in so from being consumers, consumers to being producers in whatever it is? So now social media is... I think people are getting involved now. There's, there's quite Kerry, there are all these people who are getting involved and, and creating. But I think, I think sometimes it could be an issue of confidence. If they don't feel that what they have to say is worthwhile, and I think many people have that issue, they may not feel that what they have to say is worthwhile. So if we can get people to know that what you have to say is worthwhile, that this joke, you, you are good at, you are good at giving jokes. Why don't you try making a video on jokes? My brother is great at science and I keep telling him, you need to do some videos on these things because these things I don't know. And he says, ha, ha, ha. So it could be 
a lackadaisical attitude as well and it could also be that we just don't feel confident enough so that's something that we can probably work on to, to encourage stu students probably in schools to get that done more in schools. just as how they're giving all those tablets probably cameras probably more activities like what she mentioned I'm thinking so we have one more, and then we... Uh, my name is Sylvia Wilkes, and I'm from the Cayman Islands, um, but I've, I've been studying over here for a couple of years. Um, Mr. Robinson on Wednesday indicated, or he said, he mentioned in his, his speech, that we're not to see young people as deficits, but rather as assets. And I thought that, um, especially the... Um, presentation that Ms. Linda gave was quite reassuring and because you mentioned that we're, we're, we're seeing young people as, as young people who have capacity and um, I think one of the reasons why, I, I, I must say I really enjoyed this session, um, all of your presentations, uh, especially the last one, I need to engage you. Um, I think that as, as one of the reasons I decided to uh, attend this session as well as the asset based strategies is because I'm into what is called um, develop, developmental assets. In 2012, I attended a, a, tr a training that had something to do with um, developmental assets. Is seeing young people as uh, they have 20 assets that help them to 40 assets that help them to succeed. 20 are external and 20 are internal. We don't focus too much on the external because that's where the support from family, the community is concerned. They're, them being in, involved in constructive activities is, 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 is related to. I think one of the things that we, I don't hear coming out much is the focus on the individual to be successful. Rather than focusing on young people generally, we need to see them as, 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 as individuals that we want to be successful in wherever they are now, rather than waiting till the future. So, do you want to comment on that? I think that speaks to the point of what I was saying. <clears throat> if you're running any kind of a program, I work in recreation, so we use recreation as the avenue to get youth in the building. And it might be basketball, that's the hook. It might be whatever else. The games room, you know, playing PlayStation, that's the hook. But once we get them in there, then we work on other things. And when we do what we call youth leadership, for lack of a better term, and you've got 10 youth, you have 10 different things that you have to do because you're looking at those youth as individuals. And you've got to have staff who can assess. Not assess, like, clinically. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you know, young people themselves who have the proper kind of approach, the asset-based approach to say, we're not just gonna, one size doesn't fit all, right? No. And it's about 10 youth, 10 different life paths. And that's what we're there to try to support. Okay, so I think we're almost done now. And I'd just like to thank our distinguished panelists, if you could give me a hand. So um, just, to, just to wrap up, I think a common theme coming out of these presentations was uh, the importance of process, especially engaging young people in inclusion and participation. So like we heard from both um, presentations um, related to Jamaica and Grenada, it's sometimes the informal way we engage young people. Also looking at non-traditional ways of engaging young people when we look at social media and coming out. I just have to actually say that I tried to get my dad on WhatsApp, and he said, no, I want to tweet. So <laughs> I think we need to also recognize that social media can be that platform where young people and old people engage, you know, and, and, and that's something that we need to look at in the program as well. I also have an aunt, and she's really on WhatsApp, and she'll send me a message, and at the end of every message, she'll put LOL. And I'm like, why is she saying laugh out loud? I said, Auntie, you know, you keep saying laugh out loud. And she said, no, it means lots of love. <laughs> so, oh, they, they change it around as well. And I think it's just interesting how you have all people also engage with social media. So it's something to think about. <laughs> okay, thank you all very much.